it's really nice to see that people are beginning to accept that you can eat your landscape. Exactly. And you know, surprisingly, there, there still are rules in many, many places in homeowners associations, planned communities and so forth that you cannot grow food or you can't put native plants in and you can't tear up your front lawn because it's all got to look suburban and proper. Um, and there's a place for proper and, and certainly again this is not we're not talking about creating ugly landscapes nobody wants that but um, that is still the case unfortunately and in my book as a matter of fact I, when I mentioned food growing uh, in this issue I actually say you know if you are really committed to this and you're in a situation a community or a neighborhood where you can't grow food and you want to break the rules and put some broccoli out in your yard and go to jail for it or whatever then that civil that act of civil disobedience is going to help move your community forward so interestingly enough I think I have the first dummies book that advocates civil disobedience um, they actually went for that I was quite surprised frankly but it's a very important issue let me tell you something most people don't know this, and it's a shocking statistic, and it's true, and you can look it up. Lester Brown, the World Watch Institute, um, has done some studies, and they found that there's a three-day food supply in most urban areas. Three days. Three on days. the fourth day, we're out of food. On the fourth day, we're eating what? Well, yeah, on the fourth day, each, each other or, or, you know, the grass or we don't know what, you know, ivy or something. That's not going to work. On the fourth day here... I'm going to eat my yard and I'm going to be able to enjoy the food that I have grown here. I'm also drying things in a dehydrator and preserving things. Uh, I'm going to be okay uh, for quite a while. A three-day food supply is a scary thing. We take it for granted that we can always go to the supermarket and get what we need. And it's all dependent on fossil fuels. It's dependent on cheap energy. It's dependent on stable social conditions. And all those things can change in a moment's notice. So why not create resilience for yourself? And if your neighbors don't understand it, tell them about the three-day food supply because it's important and that will definitely get their attention. So yes, you came up against this 40 years ago. People are still coming up against it today and we all have work to do to make this happen. Now the good news is that it's changing all over. San Francisco just recently legalized and endorsed the small farming that's going on in the city. It had been technically illegal. And Oakland and some other areas in the Bay Area, it's now possible with the blessing of the cities to grow and sell your own food. Uh, Detroit, talk about a stricken city, a place that's got a lot of problems. They're tearing down entire neighborhoods and they're restoring it to small uh, urban and suburban farms. Okay, But there's another key point here that I think is very important, and that's the average homeowner living in a house like this. This is a suburban house, it's a, which I describe or define as a house surrounded by some land. And you've got land north, south, east, and west of the house. The house is usually in the middle of the property. Um, most of the suburban developments are built on former agricultural land, and much of it is some of the best land in the world for growing food. We're growing ornamentals. Why the heck are we doing that? Why don't we go back and start growing food? We have, as suburbanites, if you will, we have the greatest opportunity of anyone, of anyone, to create a sustainable system. Because we have land, we have a water infrastructure, we have everything we need to create paradise. That's what I've tried to do here, is create a paradise. And you notice it's not all food. Some of it's native, some of it's ornamental. Some of them are tropical, high water use things, as we saw with the fountain and the bamboo. Well, okay, the net total of this is a highly useful, highly productive, and very beautiful landscape. And you can do this too. It's not that hard to do. There's another step beyond that, as a matter of fact, which is getting together with your neighbors, creating a what we call a food shed, which simply means your neighborhood is growing a balanced diet for everyone. It doesn't mean you have to do everything yourself and grow every single element and have 130 things like I do. I just happen to like to grow things. Let's say you only want to grow three or four things, a couple fruit trees, a particular crop that you're interested in. Get together with your neighbors and tune the neighborhood for a balanced diet so that somebody is growing something on their land that's useful for everyone. And then you do what we did here in Santa Barbara. We come together, we bring our produce, usually on foot or by bicycle, to a central location in the neighborhood, which is somebody's garden. I'm going to be doing a garden tour here this Sunday, actually for what we call the, um, the used to be called the Mesa Exchange, now it's the Santa Barbara Food Not Lawns program. 
We have 16 of these cells throughout the community here. People come together, they meet their neighbors, they bring their plums, they bring their citrus, they bring their broccoli, they bring whatever, they bring seeds, plants, baked goods, anything out of their yard. They share, they enjoy the time, the kids come along and they get to know each other. All of a sudden, people feel so much better about their neighborhood, about their neighbors, they feel safer, they have new friends, so it works on a social level as well. And now we have a community that's sustainable. We don't just have a sustainable landscape. We have a sustainable neighborhood. And then when we go out from there, then pretty soon we have a sustainable city. And this is why the suburbs are so important. If you live in a high density area, like Manhattan or Hong Kong or somewhere like that, where people are packed in, they're put up in high rises, and we're told to believe that high density is an environmentally good thing. It may be, but oftentimes it's not, because here's why. Everything that those people need has to be brought in, and all the waste has to be taken away. And they are helpless. They are helpless when it comes to providing for themselves. They can't grow any food. All they can do is go to the store and get it. Where did that food come from? It came from 100 miles away or 1,000 or 5,000 or 10,000 miles away, and it was trucked in or sent in on an airplane. And when, the, when it all goes down and our society collapses, if that's going to happen, or even if things just change to where energy is too expensive to do that, we're not going to be able to do that anymore. And those people in the high rises are going to be at a disadvantage compared to those of us who have a little bit of land around our houses, good neighbors, good community relations, and we're building a real living community. That's how good it can get. And that's why sustainable landscaping is important because it can get just that good. And it's an amazing thing when you live through it. You can't believe how good it can get. And you wonder, why did I ever have a lawn in the first place? That's amazing, Owen. So we take sustainable landscaping, amplify it, and we can have like a completely sustainable city. That's incredible. It's all up to us. It's all up to us. What are we going to do next? You know, we all know we're up against constraints. Peak oil, peak water, things are running out. We're reaching all these limits. We're going to have to do something about it. We've got to face reality. A lot of people are living in a fool's paradise thinking that this way of life is going to go on forever. When you look at just fossil fuel, for example, the use of fossil fuel, which started in 1853, I think it was, uh, when they hit the first well, they didn't even know what to do with the oil. They just, like, I think they made kerosene and the rest of it they put in the creek because they didn't know, they didn't understand how valuable it was. So 1853, we have now reached peak oil, which means half of the oil that's on this planet that we know of has been consumed. And the second half is much harder to get and it's, it requires a lot more energy put in to get the energy out of it because they're having to go deeper and do more and more extreme things as we've seen, more dangerous things. What that means is oil is going to be much more expensive over time and oil and fossil fuels are the basis of our entire economy. So we've reached that point where if you think four dollar a gallon gas is bad just stick around because it's going to be a lot more than that. Okay, So we're in this tough situation here and this is an opportunity this isn't just about decorating your house. This is much more serious than that. It's much more real than that. This is an opportunity to transform our world. You know, Lao Tzu, and I can't quote this exactly, but the great uh, Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu said something to the effect that what happens in one person will then go to the family, and the family learns the skills, and the family learns the, the right behavior. Then it goes to the neighborhood. Then it goes to the community, and it keeps expanding out to the entire world. We can start with the simple thing of our own yard and make all the changes here. And there are certainly plenty of examples of people who are feeding themselves and their neighborhoods off their own little property smaller than mine. Okay? And then it can go out and out and out. And that's why this is so important. Think about living in a world like that, a world of abundance and safety and delicious food and fun and beauty. We can have that. We can have that soon. We just have to start now. Wow. That's amazing. Owen, uh, you've given me a tremendous amount of stuff to think about here today. I'm going to have to sit on this for a little while, but you, you've mentioned such tremendous things. Can, can I get an agreement from you to take me to show me some of these, uh, uh, the, the differences, uh, the sustainable versus uh, a normal garden, so we can actually look at some of these things? Absolutely. Uh, there's so much I'd like to share. Uh, with viewers, I mean, I, this this is huge. And um, rather than just sitting here, let's get out and show people how good it can get. Because this, 
I'm, I'm only scratching the surface on this property. This is not the most sustainable place. This is not the most productive place. It's what I've done over 30 years of evolution. But I can show you some things that will absolutely blow your mind. So let's hit the road. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Owen, thank you very much for, for talking with me today and, and sharing what you have. Uh, I'm looking forward to coming back in the very, very near future and uh, seeing some more of what you can show me. I've, I would love to see your uh, your food shed come together, and um, I know that we've been able to create a sense of community in our community gardens, but what I, I can only imagine what you're able to do with a, a neighborhood of people that actually see each other all the time. Come over on Sunday, and you can see it all happening right here. It's really fun. Oh, so, great. yeah, I mean, there's there's so much people don't really realize how much energy is behind all this stuff and how many good things are happening. So let's go have a look at it. All right. All right. Very good. Thanks, Thank Mike. Thank you, Owen. Appreciate it. Owen Dell, the Master of Sustainable Gardening. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for being here.